Dr. Orko? Yeah, I am here, Shelby. Okay, maybe you can um, share your slides. At least we can test out your slides. Yeah. We start at 11 sharp. Sure. Okay, perfect. You can see it, right? Yes. All right. You want to keep the screen sharing on or should I stop sharing? Yeah, let's keep it on. All right. How are you doing otherwise? All good, Shilpi. Are you venturing out at all? I haven't ventured out since lockdown. Yeah, <laughs> yeah better okay. not to. Yeah. Yeah, Delhi is in a crazy state. Huh? Yeah, and all our teaching is online and everything. So actually, it's really busy mm. because all the work is going on plus like you know, the lockdown stuff, so. Yeah. Hello, Varka. Varka? Ma, we can't hear you very clearly. Hello. Hello, Varka, can you hear me? Hi. Good morning, Sivadi. How are you? Thanks for joining in. <laughs> Certainly. Everybody is waiting for Ready to hear what you have to say. <laughs> yeah, yours is the. I think a lot of people are logging in for this one. My student was uh, trying to help me uh, make a historical timeline of how we arrived at gene therapy for muscle disorders but it's not quite finished oh but yeah and just for some academic interest yeah that's really interesting so uh, uh, previously in the um, uh, when i spoke at the uh, DMD, the PBMD uh, uh, meeting. I was speaking partly in Hindi and partly in English. So you wanted us to do the same, is it? Yeah, because we have some patients who don't understand Hindi and some who don't understand English. So it's really a mix. Yeah. I'll keep it mostly to English till I get to the to what we have done with the GNE work. So at that point, I'll explain some things and then where we can take it for, how we can take it forward. So that part I'll explain in Hindi as well. So I guess that's the only part of interest. All others are garnishings. I would be interested in hearing this talk in Bangla. Yes. Bangla, Viboram dite ye to jaan ko lage jaba. <laughs> I had a question. Why there are very few Bengali patients in GNE myopathy? Why there aren't? My yeah. best guess would be there isn't a, a myologist there on hmm. the eastern side who is uh, properly diagnosing. Yeah. That's just it. So the neurology in uh, West Bengal is really not very well uh, focused. Yeah, actually. Okay, so we'll start now. Over to you, Dr. Orko. Okay. All right. Uh, you can all see my slides. Yes. Okay. So 
it's still morning so good morning everyone and uh, thank you to the entire gne bhattacharya family for pulling all of this together and for uh, bringing us together to uh, to fight this challenge uh, of gene gne so i'm going to speak exclusively on gene therapy and uh, that's what i've been working on for uh, several years now so what is gene therapy uh, it is a technique that corrects the effect of defective genes so uh, as all of uh, the patients and uh, patient supporters who are here they know that you have a mutation that causes the disease and this is true for all kinds of muscle disease eye disease blood disease etc so if your gene is not doing the normal function you have uh, a few different ways of correcting that so one is uh, to put back the right copy of the gene into the cell to matlab jo gene kharab hai uske badle uska jo sahi जीन है वो हम बाहर से पेशेंट के बॉडी के अंदर डाल देते हैं सो दैट्स द प्राइमरी एंड द मोस्ट कॉमनली डन थिंग व्हिच इज व्हाट वी आर गोना ट्राई एंड डू फॉर जीएनई मायोपैथी एज वेल द अदर मेथड्स आर स्लाइटली मोर कॉम्प्लिकेटेड व्हिच आर व्हेन एन अबनॉर्मल जीन इज ट्रेडेड बाय अ नॉर्मल जीन व्हिच इज व्हिच हैपेंस थ्रू रिकॉम्बिनेशन the abnormal gene can be repaired through selective reverse mutations or gene editing so this is what uh, the promise of crispr cas9 is or crispr other cas enzymes are and a partially correct copy of the gene can be expressed by alternate splicing or by reading through a stop codon so this is uh, an example of this is exon skipping so sarepta has brought uh, some of these exon skipping uh, ideas into clinics uh, you're all well aware of the uh, atiplers and etc for uh, dmd and uh, there is um, another aspect of gene therapy which is primarily applicable to cancers which is the change in regulation of genes so here even if the gene is mutated or not you put in a gene for example a p53 gene which can uh, be used to get rid of the cancer so uh, again this is sort of a sad story that there are uh, thousands of gene therapy trials happening around the world but uh, none in india most of these gene therapy uh, trials use adenoviruses and retroviruses there's a certain amount of uh, uh, plasmic dna which are being uh, delivered through liposomes and uh, as a lot of you might know the first uh, gne gene therapy was done by introducing a plasmid using a liposome lipoplex so most of these gene therapy trials are happening in the united states uh, followed by uk uh, this fair amount happening in germany and china as well but none in india most of the gene therapy trials are focused on cancers uh, there's a fair amount of interest in uh, monogenic diseases of course uh, but that's a distant second and finally uh, most of these uh, trials are in phase 1 uh, some of them are in phase 2 phase 3 but a lot of them in the last 3 to 4 years have come out in the market and are in end stage uh, trials as well so what are the different kinds of gene therapy products that we have so you have uh, the the gene that you have needs to be delivered inside the cells of the patients so this is the most critical aspect that a gene therapy needs to address so we have viral vectors and non viral vectors and each of these vectors uh have their own positives and negatives uh, the the key is of course to use the right kind of vector for the right kind of disease and uh the right uh method of delivery so that having been said all these vectors need to have a few common uh features so they have to be 
able to carry the the gene they ideally should be undetectable by the immune system and be non toxic and non inflammatory uh these vectors should be uh should have some amount of safety that allows them to be used in patient where the tissues would already have some pre existing inflammation necrosis etc and finally a very key aspect of it is the duration of expression so once you deliver it it should be available for a long long time and uh, there are a number of uh, gene and cell therapies that have now come into the market so if you look at the box in the middle so these are the gene therapies so the blue box are cell therapies that's mostly for uh, blood and blood disorders so here if you look at it most of these are for cancers but you do have a couple of uh, monogenic disorders like uh, lca and uh, um, uh, jandison and there's a bunch of fact, uh, companies that have also uh, come out with it uh, with a variety of different gene therapies and those are listed in the left so what we work on what we work on is um, a vector called the adeno associated viral vector so these are currently the gold standard for doing uh, gene therapy because they uh, deliver uh, efficiently to both dividing and non dividing cells they have very high levels of uh, they can achieve very high levels of gene expression the vector by itself doesn't have any viral genes and that is the biggest uh, safety aspect of aav and there's a bunch of uh, data now for uh, successful in vivo administration in patients uh, with without uh, too much toxicity or immune reaction unless the dose is very high so now we know uh, that the av for lca2 is uh, which is marketed by spark therapeutics is already available and zolgensma has also come out however uh, as uh, lale was referring to there's been a death in the high dose group in the mtm1 trial so that tells us that um, we need to figure out what is a safe dose beyond which even av becomes uh, very toxic so in my uh past work what i've shown is that um, av mediated gene therapy can actually uh, reach every part of the body this is in mice where i show that you can reach um uh, transduction very high levels of transduction in the muscle so this is um, a reporter gene which gives you this purple color so you can see that uh, both hind limbs four limbs heart diaphragm everything can be reached with a single dose of av and we were able to show that this works even in uh, animal models uh, in large animal models uh, like dogs uh, and what we also show is that there is uh, uh, a certain amount of interplay with the host immune response because in adult dogs there is lesser expression at longer time points so that is something that needs to be managed so coming to what uh, uh, we've been working on towards uh, gne gene therapy we have now constructed an av vector system that expresses gne so this is part of the uh, uh, work that was funded by wwgm and this is just uh, just the cloning to show that we we arrived at this vector construct where the gne the uh, 753 amino acid uh, uh, isotype is driven by cmv so we have that and then we uh, used that vector to show the gne protein expression in c2 c12 cells so these are muscle cells and what you can see very clearly is these are independent replicates you can see very robust expression of gne <clears throat> and this is an uh, av carrying gfp to show that uh, as a control so we have this construct so what's next with it is um, so we've packaged the gne construct in av9 
and uh, we want to differentiate the uh, C2C3 of cells into myotubes. So this is what the figure here shows that these are myotubes. So this is muscle cells on a plate. And um, uh, we, have, we were supposed to have finished all of this work to, if COVID hadn't hit. Um, so we had a lab um, working at low strength for a while. So essentially, once we, um, and this, this works, the, the construct works, the vector ex expresses GNE as expected. So uh, where are we headed? So the first thing that we need to uh, consider is uh, looking at a muscle-specific promoter. So in case of a muscle-specific promoter, uh, there's a parallel program that is funded by PPMD, another patient uh, organization that um, uh, is working with us for DMD gene therapy. And under that, we have developed this SPC 512 muscle specific promoter. This is from um, uh, a European group, but it is off patent as of now. The second thing is to have uh, better capsids, the AV capsids, so that we can have better transduction and lesser uh, immune reaction. So uh, Jayendran Rao at IIT Kanpur he is a collaborator of mine. So he has been working on developing immune evasion capsids for several years. This has to be followed by large scale vector production of clinical grade. And on the patient side, of course, we need to have uh, antibody testing, neutralizing antibody testing, genetic validation, et cetera, establishment of the uh, correct uh, or the most uh, sensitive muscle function tests so that we can evaluate whether the gene therapy can, is working once we administer to patients. And then of course, uh, uh, develop the exact trial protocols. So whatever I said in the previous slide is essentially on this slide in a picture. So I'll explain this slide in Hindi uh, and maybe in the future in Bangla but only uh, Hindi for today. So GNE gene jo hai, wo humne ek uh, vec uh, vector mein daala hai, jo vector se hum AV vector particles banayenge, jo ki GNE express karega. So ye uh, slide mein hum dikha rahe hain ki ye vector humne already develop kiya hai, aur iska packaging cell line mein hum wo virus banayenge which will express matlab jo ki gne express karega ye part jo hai hamara ye more or less ye ho chuka hai ab jo hame karna hai wo hai ki ye jo humne banaya hai isko animals mein humko check karna hai to ye chuhon mein check karte hain ki us usse kuch koi bura ho raha hai kya kuch kharab ho raha hai kya koi problem aa rahi hai kya to ye hone ke baad tab hum prepare karenge uh, for uh, human trials. Matlab, uh, iske liye patients ka selection hona correctly zaruri hai, uh, genetic testing hona zaruri hai, aur uh, patients ko aur kya kya takleefe hain, aur koi conditions hai kya, aur koi marize hain, uh, koi uh, bimariyaan hai kya, to us pe nirvar karega, wo patient trial mein aa sakta hai ki nahi. To ye pura process uh, करने के लिए hopefully हम लोग सब एक साथ जुट के next steps ले सकते हैं. So uh, in if we do have to design a gene therapy trial, so these are my thoughts on how we might go uh, about doing this. Uh, first, like Dr. Nalini said, that uh, the natural history of these uh, patients, these must be known. So the patients who are in, who are potentially enrollable in the trial, their uh, natural history has to be known, the uh, mutations has to have to be known, and we also must know what all treatments have been taken thus far, because uh, that is very key to control any uh, adverse immunologic events that might follow after administering the, uh, the vectors. So from uh, what we know from the single gene therapy trial that was done uh, by John uh, Nemunyatis, I think, uh, 
almost a decade, exactly a decade ago, I think, where he injected. Time is almost up. Okay. Lipoplexus, we know that there are uh, serum transaminases, etc., that go up. So, so we need to know all of this for the next steps. So what are we doing uh, here in India? We have uh, developed a clean room facility for making clinical grade gene therapy vectors. And uh, this facility is uh, functional as of now. Uh, so we have the capability to make these vectors and take it to the next step. And the national gene therapy guidelines are also out. So I think we are okay to go uh, and plan for a future gene therapy trial. So summary is just what we have talked about just now. And this is the team. And I uh, am particularly thankful to uh, PPMD and uh, World Without Gene Myopathy for the gene therapy work for muscle diseases that we are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Orko. Uh, and there are some questions for you also already on the chat box, which you could look at. So we'll take questions at the end. Now I'd like to invite Dr. Ganguly to uh, give her talk. Please, Dr. Ganguly. You are muted, Dr. Ganguly. Yeah, am I audible? Absolutely perfect. All right. So good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Mudia Ganguly. I'm a scientist at uh, CSIR IGIB. And uh, first of all, I would like to really thank the organizers for you know giving me this opportunity to speak. Um, I was introduced to the area of gene myopathy just about you know a few months back uh, by Professor Alok and Sudha Bhattacharya, and uh, my lab works on uh, you know uh, different non-viral uh, systems for gene therapy, and uh, we had we had absolutely no uh, exposure to gene myopathy. We still haven't started working on it but because we have been working on non-viral uh, therapies uh, gene delivery systems for the last 10 years or so i strongly believe that you know we will have uh, something to offer and uh, so today's talk will be more on uh, a, a more of a general uh, one and um, yeah so and i'll also show a few things that uh, you know, we have been doing in this area in the past few years so uh, Orko has already given a very uh, you know, elaborate uh, description of what gene therapy is all about. And this is a really, really simplistic uh, uh, representation. And you are all now familiar with the fact that you have to introduce the therapeutic transgene. It has to go to the target cell, enter the nucleus, produce the therapeutic protein. Uh, if you have a cell which doesn't have the functioning gene, you can introduce it directly. Or if the functioning gene, if it is uh, functioning in an aberrant way, you have to uh, block the gene. These are the two most common ways in which uh, we would work. And uh, uh, how does one do that? So, so we need delivery systems because DNA we cannot, or, or the gene we cannot, uh, you know, from the outside, it doesn't enter the cells easily because of its size, its charge. Uh, and uh, so therefore you need uh, delivery systems uh, in order to introduce it. So uh, viral systems uh, have already been uh, spoken about. That's the most common way in which uh, you can introduce genes from the outside. Uh, there are also certain chemicals, uh, which we call the non-viral delivery system, which uh, can package the DNA that you want to send. And uh, th through these chemicals, these chemicals have certain properties, which will allow them to package the DNA and make them into really small, tiny, uh, nanometric sized particles, uh, which, are, which is like one billionth of a meter uh, in size, so really, really small. And they can be there, thereby introduced into the human body. They can be directly introduced through in vivo gene therapy, or you could have the cells isolated from the patient and modified in vitro and then uh, put back, which is the ex vivo way of doing it. Um, 
So what are these chemicals that I'm talking about? Uh, these are mostly, um, you know, these are the different classes of chemicals that I've listed out here. Uh, lipids are the most common ones. And uh, then you have uh, long chain polymers. You have nanoparticles. These are inorganic small particles. And then you also have peptides, which are like, you know, parts of uh, proteins. So all the, the most common uh, feature of all these, uh, um, all these different chemicals is that they are all positively charged. They also have certain other properties, but they interact with DNA, which is negatively charged and form these multitude of structures. So, uh, and these are called like, you know, if you have a lipid, they're called lipoplates. If you have a polymer, they're called polyplates. But nanocomplex is something that is common to uh, all. So these are nanometric sized particles. The DNA, as you can see in this figure, this uh, you know, small, tiny blue bits. This is the DNA and the structure of the chemical can be you know, uh, quite different from each other, but they have the common factor that they are all positively charged and they can interact with the DNA to package it in uh, different ways. And uh, so, so this also, Orko had already shown that while viruses are the most common method still of uh, uh, introducing genes. Uh, we do have certain uh, other methods that are coming up in the last few years, like like infection is using uh, lipids to deliver the DNA. And uh, what is the advantage of you know not going for a viral method uh, but choosing a non-viral instead? Uh, so uh, in general, these chemicals uh, the toxicity is uh, quite low. They are uh, most of them are synthesized, so they, they are like you know, easy to prepare and uh, the cost is also not very high. They are usually uh, less immunogenic. And one very important factor is that very large sizes of DNA can be easily introduced by making these complexes. Another very important unique feature is that the surface of these particles can be modified for better targeting. So by better targeting, I, uh, what I mean, I'll just come to the uh, uh, next slide. So this is, these are the steps that you have to do. You have to prepare your nanocomplex. You have to inject it in the body. Once you, it enters the bloodstream, it will, there will be, it will be interacting with the different components in the bloodstream. And, uh, uh, but it will also have to come out and bind to the receptors in some cases, some places and other ways. It has to enter the cell that uh, you know, we're targeting. So it has to reach the target cell and enter the cell and then inside the cell it has to enter the nucleus and then express the uh, DNA. Uh, now, so I uh, spoke about uh, what are the advantages of doing it in the non-viral method, but there are also many challenges and if I explain to you these steps, you'll understand. Uh, first of all, the na nanocomplex has to have a balanced packing and unpacking. So uh, uh, what I mean by that is that uh, in order to keep it stable, you have to, the, the DNA and the chemical have to interact and form these you know, tiny, tiny particles. But at the same time, they also have to have the DNA coming out of them once they reach the target place. Okay? So it cannot be unstable while it is traveling through your body, reaching the uh, cell of interest. Uh, but at the same time, inside, it has to release the DNA. So that balance has to be brought about. And uh, that is brought about usually by by the design. So the design of the delivery system is very critical to achieve this. It has also has to remain stable in the bloodstream because you know, it has to go and reach your uh, target destination. So it has to not get degraded in the bloodstream or get aggregated. Uh, so you have to attach some chemical moieties on the surface, like you know, these tiny, tiny things that are shown on the surface. You have to attach these in order to make it stable. Uh, different kinds of chemicals are there to do that. It also has to reach the target cell. So you ha also have to put some sort of uh, you know, chemicals as address labels, which will take it to the cell that you want it to uh, reach to. And once it is done that, it has to enter the cells. Inside the cell also, there are many tiny, tiny compartments uh, you know, from which it has to uh, come out and enter the nucleus and uh, the gene has to express. So all these uh, um, steps that uh, it has to follow uh, is sort of guided by how well you have designed the vector, okay? so designed the delivery system. So that's the major challenge. And uh, so, so the one class of molecules that we are working on 
uh, are called cell penetrating peptides and uh, these are like the short peptide sequences they are very simple in their uh, in the nature they are mostly positively charged contain a lot of arginines they are pretty safe to use and they're easy to modify so you can attach different kinds of moieties to the to the peptides they are generally non immunogenic and they are quite economical to uh, uh, you, know, you can get them synthesized uh, or in the lab also you can uh, uh, quite easily synthesize them if you have a synthesizer. So these CPPs uh, have been used to deliver different types of cultures, not only DNA but many other kinds of uh, molecules to many different organs of the human body. Okay, So uh, they have some unique features that makes them enter uh, multiple cell types and that is the area that we are uh, we have been uh, uh, you know, working on. So this is, uh, in a nutshell, what we do. We uh, design novel peptides. Uh, we play around with their length, their composition, what kind of amino acids you use, what kind of structures you will use. And uh, by playing around with the peptide structure, you make different kinds of nano complexes. Uh, you also study their stability and uh, the size, the surface charge, and coat them with molecules that will keep them stable in the circulation and also, uh, you know, put uh, signature molecules that will target them to particular type of cells. And uh, then, you know, once they are uh, designed, we test them out in vitro in the uh, cultured cells. And like, for example, this, you see here, the green dots actually indicate the DNA, so it has been taken up efficiently by these cells. And uh, this is also, this, this figure shows that, you know, we have used these systems that we have developed into in uh, different uh, cell types. So, so here you can see that these are the different cell types that are generating from multiple different organs. So this is in vitro, but we do see that our vector, the, the blue and the light blue and the dark blue lines indicate the level of expression of our system and the green line indicates some commercial agent and we are actually able to achieve uh, efficiency of uh, which is equivalent to some of the commercial agents and with very little toxicity and uh, you know, all the other parameters are uh, quite uh, good to go. Uh, we have, uh, so that was in the cells and we have chosen skin as one of the organs with, in which we, were, uh, we have been working for the past two, three years and we have shown that these nanocomplexes can enter uh, the skin cells, they can enter the skin tissue. This is a, a, a ex vivo experiment with human skin tissue. The green line indicates the uh, the lower, lowest layer of the skin epidermis and the red, red spots indicate the expression of the DNA. So you can see it goes well beyond the epidermis. This is on the mouse skin. And uh, we try to make them into formulations using different chemicals and show that, you know, they indeed uh, go into the cells more, uh, go into the tissue more efficiently. And we also make them targeted by playing around with the peptide sequence and some targeted expression also we have been able to achieve. And uh, for our uh, academic interest, we are also studying their uh, you know, mechanism of entry. So these uh, nanocomplexes, we have uh, you know, made them work for skin by uh, altering the uh, amino acid sequence in such a way that and uh, attaching moieties in such a way that it enters only the, a certain type of skin cells. And we have been able to do that quite efficiently. Um, So I don't know why the, uh, okay. So, uh, sorry. so um, as I said that, you know, we really haven't started doing anything in JNE biopathy as such, but since we have got the expertise of developing non-viral gene delivery systems, what we could do is that modify our existing systems to accommodate very large cargoes, and uh, to get sustained gene delivery in muscle cells and also design them in such a way that we are able to not only make them stable, uh, but also do a targeted delivery. So this is what we are uh, you know, thinking of doing with our own, uh, 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 with the peptide sequences that we already have developed. And uh, I'm very hopeful that with, uh, you know, in the coming uh, months uh, or a year or so, we would be able to um, make uh, a new system that will be helpful for uh, gene delivery, non-viral gene delivery in uh, gene marketing.
So thank you very much. And uh, once again, uh, thanks to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ganguly, for that wonderful talk. Uh, and we hope that um, this work can be carried forward in for GNE as well. We're really, really looking forward to that. Um, so I think there were a number of questions. Uh, those who have questions now can please raise their hands and I can take them. There were some questions for uh, Dr. Ghosh in the chat box. I think Dr. Ghosh has seen most of them. Um, Neetu had some questions on time, the timeline for gene therapy. I don't know if Dr. Ghosh wants to address them. Were there any questions um, doc, uh, for Dr. Ganguly? Did anyone have questions? So for the patients, we'll be explaining this more simply post lunch. Yeah, I think uh, this question from Neetu Singh, I think um, Alokda would be the best person to answer it as to the timeline. <laughs> because we as scientists, we are restricted by what we can do with the resources we have. So, Bob, I, let me put in, in this uh, proper perspective what uh, uh, where we can go along this line in these two things. Uh, one is that uh, we have seen... Um, uh, some trials that I have been looking into where we have seen people even have used CMB uh, promoter-based systems and gone into patients. There is a phase one, phase two trial done with CMB, but using the, the other muscle-specific promoter, that can be one way that we can still go to it, uh, do some patient trials, see whether a year or two with adequate funding, we can actually start at least developing enough uh, data so that we can actually apply for a, a limited uh, phase one trial uh, that can be done. But we, we need, uh, the patient group must realize that we need money to do that. And uh, without money, that cannot be done. For Munia, I think one thing that can be done is that uh, if you can go do a kind of pilot experiment, you can straight go into animal with your system package GNE and see if it gets into muscles or not. Just a dirty, quick experiment to do that. So we want to follow every possibility that we have. We definitely, I mean, this is something Orca has been saying that we can go with it. But most of the trials that CMB promoter people are using, as Orca had told us before, uh, these are in um, restricted site like eye or diaphragm or uh, directly muscle or something like that. So people have found that, um, you know, if you give uh, AV uh, using even CMB promoter, they, they don't produce toxicity of directly inject into diaphragm. This is Jerry Mendel has done that expert um, and there's a published data suggesting that you don't see toxicity if you directly do it. So the suggestion that you directly inject into muscle can be done it. And the patient community, my thing is that if we can generate some money, at least we can finish the preclinical work on that direction. And then we can go ahead, whatever the system we have, as you say, with the SCF promoter, if that system produces um, in animal muscles experiment, and apart from C2, C2 cells or human muscle cells, then I think we can collect the data and think about going to it. We would need funding and that funding is very, very important for us. And as I said, Munia can do a quick and dirty experiment to see it works. Then based on that, we can actually, you want to modify the surface, you want to modify this and that, that can be done. That can be done. So the timeline, Mito, is that let's let's all put together and make generate some funds so that we can take it forward. We can actually go straight forward into it because there's enough uh, published information saying that these vectors directly inject into tissues do not produce toxicity. Is that okay? Is there any? Yeah, Shilpi, take over. 
there were a number of questions for Dr. Ganguly in the chat box. I think Ma also had one. Uh, maybe you want to just respond briefly, Dr. Ganguly? Yes, I'm, I'm doing that. Yeah. Do you want? To, will you respond on the chat box, or you can even like say it? We have a few minutes. I, I am already responding. I am okay. responding to most of these questions. Yeah. Does anyone have? Does anyone have follow-ups for Dr. Ghosh or Dr. Ganguly? We have. Uh, just wanted if you could elaborate a little bit about what is already known about uh, delivery of your system to muscle cells. How efficient is it? Can you just tell us a little bit about what is already known about delivery to muscle cells? How efficient is it? I could, was that for me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's for you. It's for you, Munia. I just wanted to know if you can tell us a little bit about the efficiency of delivery of your system to muscle cells. Mm -hmm. Is there already some information in that regard? Uh, not that I know of offhand, uh, but and we haven't uh, tested in muscle cells yet. Uh, but we have tested in, in, as far as cell lines as well as primary cells are concerned. We have tried from di many different uh, organs, and uh, primarily with skin, but others as well. And uh, we usually, like uh, you know, for the reporter uh, gene expression, we usually do get more than 80% positive cells in many of the cases. Uh, so we are pretty uh, hopeful that you know, it will work in the muscle cells also, but I am not absolutely sure about uh, you know, literature uh, reports on that. And uh, of course with my system, there won't be any. So, um, but with lipids, uh, I don't have the exact information, but I could you know, look and look up and uh, let you know. Yeah. Thank you, thanks. So, uh, can I ask one question also? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Amali, <clears throat> uh, what is the duration of expression that you see after you deliver? That's, that's always an issue. Uh, but we do, uh, uh, we have checked up to uh, 72 and some cases 96 hours. And uh, yeah, so of course 48 hours, you know, in all the cases you do see. Right. Uh, but uh, in many cases, up to 72, few cases up to 96 also we have observed. So, okay. but we haven't checked beyond that in, uh, in culture. Yeah. In case of skin tissue, we have, uh, you know, uh, but there also we, we need uh, multiple applications, but it's only topical. So there is no question of injection, etc. So once you do, right. uh, we usually do three uh, applications, uh, one each day, a certain amount. And we check the expression uh, 72 and 96 hours after the last uh, application. So it's essentially you like three looked at longer time points. Uh, yeah. At yeah. one month or one year. Uh, no, we haven't. We haven't. So repeated administration will be necessary. And uh, but but you know we, we would have to figure out how to change the uh, the, uh, the the DNA system. Uh, rather than the uh, agent, because with the agent, you know, this is probably uh, the most that you could, or maybe a little more than mm -hmm. that, but yeah, so you have to change the expression system in order to make it more system. So, Munia, there's uh, uh, one last mm -hmm. question is that, uh, you know, there's Moderna's messenger RNA based vaccine that oh. must be also packaged, right? Yes. So, what kind of packaging system they use? I mean, they are able to package it and send it. So, uh, so that. Uh, okay. uh, one important thing about vaccine is that you only need a small amount. You want yeah, it one send yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's only for a few days and a few hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As in a monogenic disease. I know you I need to yes. put it in a long. Yeah, I fully agree with that. But I was wondering. So, what kind have of we have non-viral and viral. Yeah. Yeah, they are both viral. But then the immune response is also dependent on the um, adjuvant that you use. That's very critical. And the uh, packaging is also adjuvant. So, mm. okay. All right, Shilpi. And there is, I think, some question. Uh, yeah, I'm just answering one by one. So. Wonderful okay. talk, Dr. Ganguly. Dr. Kush, do you have any other questions? No, I'm good. Thank you. Dr. Gaudi, you didn't have any for Dr. Ghosh, right? No. It was a very nice time. So. Okay, thank you so much to both of you for a wonderful session.
Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you'll have work to do with responding to all those questions. So thank you so much for your patience in responding to all our questions as well, both of you. So now we move on to our next session. Uh, and I invite Dr. Gopal, uh, Dr. Gopal to uh, please come and share his slides as well. Dr. Gopal. Can you enable the share screen option, please? Baba. Hmm? Dr. Gopal, is he not a co-host? Oh. Gopal, I just see whether you are a co-host or not. Not a co-host. It's going to take a second, please. BG. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I was looking for Gopal and I couldn't find Gopal in it. Okay, now you can go ahead and share. Perfect. Can you see this? Can I go full screen? Mm, yeah. I hope you can see this. So, thanks, uh, Halogda and uh, others for inviting me to this session. Uh, so this is going to be a change from whatever you heard a little bit uh, since morning. Yeah. So this is going to give you a perspective of basic biology and as to why one would need to use this approach in, if we wanted to also look for therapeutic remedies. As Alokta also told me that I should uh, try to speak a bit in Hindi and I am not a native slash wild type uh, Hindi speaker. So there might be grammatical and perhaps gender-based mutations and you'll have to excuse me as we go along. So I'll start. Dr. Kupal, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but is it possible to switch on your video or not? Uh, I, I, I think it will be a bandwidth issue. Yesterday when we tested it, okay. because there are some movie slides and I felt, okay. I'll, in the question answer sessions, I'll show you how I look and you'd be yeah. genuinely scared, I'm sure. Okay. Uh, uh, so I'll start off. So why, so from a basic biology perspective, why is it that uh, these mutations essentially lead to changes in function? So if you were to look at it, essentially the protein is made, it gets folded. Now what happens in, so we are now going to start off with very simplistic perspective because we are basic protein chemist and structural biologist. We this polypeptide, protein is the major difference out here is this particular protein, the GNE protein, essentially can form either tetramers or hexamers. Yani ki yo protein ban jata hai aur uske char aggregate hote hain aur wo ek con- combined entity ki taraf se kaam karte hain. When you now have a mutation, now this is something which I hope you would uh, try and follow this. Protein hai kuch 730 ya 740 amino acid ban. The first part is an epimerase. That's roughly about 60% of the protein. The second part is the kinase. So in terms of basic chemistry, what does this protein do? What this protein does is it essentially takes UDP glucnac, makes it into glucna, UDP and MANNAC. And as I follow the chat box, I'm very, very impressed, genuinely impressed that people have, or have been looking at it fairly seriously as to what happened with the clinical trials on the MANMAC and where is it going. The second step is where the, where the problem starts. MANMAC now needs to be acted upon by the kinase. That is the second part of this protein, your C terminal uh, domain. Here. So that MANMAC now is acted upon by the kinase, and now you have a phosphorylated MANMAC. This in turn now, of course, takes the with phosphoenoid pyruvate leads to a subsequent set of events. So the basic work that we have been trying to do is to understand how aggregation, if at all that happens with a mutation, how does that happen? Second, why are mutations spread across? Of course, we I suspect we know little because as uh, one of the chat box points also came in uh, during Dr. Nandini's talk that you now have this is 727 valine to methionine and a few other mutants and how they alter function. So that's the role. To summarize, essentially what I'm going to tell you in the next five minutes comes in this, in this green box here. I hope you can even see the pointer. 
I'm going to be talking about how this protein folds and why it's important to understand the structure. Why when you understand the structure, you also get to know what happens to its interacting partners and why is that relevant? And most importantly, how does this actually form the basis for looking at therapeutic strategies? I'll start off. You see this movie out here. So this is a structure of the epimerase, which is in terminal wala domain. If you look at this pointer, ko dekh paane, so you would see two distinct entities. One part out here, which I'm pointing inside this green blob, is the substrate, that is UDP glucanide. What you also see is this oligomeric, dimeric interface. Now that is where you have feedback inhibition. So the epimerase, the N-terminal domain of the structure is the one which oligomerizes. That's the first part of the jigsaw that was effectively worked out. The main issue, which is why we struggle even up to this point to be able to get therapeutics for the, based on this protein, is this link between the epimerase and the kinase domain. It's very flexible. So when it becomes very flexible, you really don't know how the kinase domain is vis-a-vis -vis the N-terminal. So ye to pakka tight tetramer ban gaya. Par ye, ye hone ke baad, kinase domain yahan se kaise jata hai. So this, unfortunately, from the crystallographic perspective, becomes a limiting factor that you have too many variations. So one variant that we have started, and this is recent, uh, recent work, I would say about a few months ago, that uh, a young colleague in my department, Somnath Dutt, has been starting to work on looking at these, this entire chimeric protein in using cryo-electron microscope. Why is this important? Because this will now help us both to understand aspects of aggregation and therefore we can ask the very basic question. If this protein is under aggregate, then will there be a compound that can be able to reduce the aggregation of this aggregation? And you can reduce the rest of the downstream effects of CLA acid production if it is solved. So we are also trying to use this structural biology tool as a way of developing an assay. Kaham karte kya asme? Purified protein. Now this is where, of course, I should be very careful when I say this so that I don't lead you into a different track. Ye jo protein humko chahiye hota, ye human protein hai, aur usme post-translation modifications bhi honge. Iska matlab ye hai ki isko bacterial expression system mein aap isme aasani se bana nahi paoge. Iske liye kuch aur karna padta hai. और ये प्रोटीन प्योरिफाइड प्रोटीन आने के बाद हमें ये देखना होगा कि ये प्योरिफाइड प्रोटीन वाइल्ड टाइप में क्या एक सिंगल फॉर्म लेता है यहाँ पे आप एक माइक्रोग्राफ देखेंगे ये एक रिप्रेजेंटेटिव माइक्रोग्राफ है और इसमें आप कई ऐसे छोटे-छोटे पार्टिकल्स आपको दिख जाएंगे इसमें बीस रिप्रेजेंट or a tetramer or a hexamer. And this again depends upon the kind of compounds that are there, including substrate inhibition. You now have a new problem. So this is something that we have begun working on. In terms of the actual strategies that we are kind of trying to do, you had heard people talking about how difficult it is to raise money and so on and so forth. But this is something that we do day in, day out. So we have started off on thinking in that direction on something that we can physically do right away. What is it that would be important for this basic biology problem to be taken up by a company or a biotech company, a large pharma? You need assays. So for this, what we are trying to now work on on an immediate basis, this is the short to medium term goal, is an interesting possibility that we might be able to scale this up into high throughput screening. Or jab tak hum high throughput screening nahi banate, tab tak आपको ये पूरे ढेर सारे जो लाइब्रेरी होते हैं स्मॉल मॉलिक्यूल कंपाउंड्स का उनको हम इन वीट्रो यानी कि टेस्ट ट्यूब में टेस्ट नहीं कर पाते तो वो उसके लिए ये एक स्ट्रेटजी है जिस जिस पर दिस पर्टिकुलर दिस वर्क इज बीइंग डन इन आईजीआईबी नाउ दिस इज नॉट एमबीयू बट दिस इज अ पार्ट and uh, what Kaushik is also working on is therapeutically used chemical chaperones and so on and small molecule libraries which he would like to examine and we would be going back and forth with this process. What I have failed to mention out here, and which I think I would add now, is it is possible, and that's something that we have already started work on, 
is to now use coarse grained models to ask this particular question. The ephemeral structure is nice. It's high resolution, about 2.5, okay -ish. And you have a kinase domain which can still be modeled. Can you now do simulations which would allow you to ex essentially examine what would be the features that would lead to aggregation and potentially explain some of the point mutation data? Yeah. Experimentally, how example If you were to now even throw a raw, unexperienced eye, what you would be able to see out here is different micrographs. I'm now, if you can see my pointer, the first one would tell you what happens when you have a native protein. The second one would tell you what you have with, with very specific compounds. You begin to see specific patterns out here, which was not visible earlier. What it tells you is that the protein now becomes what we as biochemists would call better behaved. It forms a single monomeric or, or a single oligomeric species. Similarly, when we now start adding different substrates and so on, you would now begin to see these things forming fibrils. So what you can begin to see is it's now beginning to mimic its native functional state much, much better than before. So it means those things immediately that. First, what is it that you need for this protein to be stabilized and the second what combination of these compounds would give you the most possible stable structure and that forms the basis for subsequent chemical biology experiments that we do in this business so where is it that we are going you can see these three molecules the fundamental basis for this entire structural biology approach is the GNE myopathy, which is because of point mutations, at this point of time, we assume it's a single gene disease, i.e. GNE alone. It could be others as more data comes along. But the point mutations, we argue, alter the dynamics. If they alter the dynamics, what happens is you will see all these features which I'm trying to show you out here. Next, so what we want to do is design assays which would allow you very quick answers, quick and dirty answers, I would suspect. Does this particular chemical mod modulator bring back catalytic activity in a mutant enzyme to some percentage of the wild type? Ideal case scenario, identical to the wild type. What would both those modulators be? I would be careful here. I've used the word modulator, and which means that we still need a high resolution structure of the kinase domain. What's, what's important other specialists in the audience. The kinases are important because you don't have a wide variety of chemical compounds which work with kinases. In fact, you know, they, for example, you would like to look at that. So where would we eventually live? But we will keep trying. And the idea being, eventually what we would like to lead at the end of this project is a set of chemical lead compounds with a set of viable assays and we say, yes, this is how it works. Would some large farmer would like to take it up and see it forward. So I'd like to acknowledge my, my friends and colleagues who are a part of this. And uh, Kasturi and Alok from Ashoka University, Alokta from Ashoka University, Kaushik from uh, IGIB, and Shwamnath and myself from IIC. It's a project, it's a fledgling project. We are trying. And, we, and hopefully in your subsequent meetings at some point in time, you would probably see me uh, with some more really solid data. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you. I'm done. Thank you so much, Dr. Gopa. That was really interesting. Uh, I would like to now invite our next speaker, Dr. Banerjee. And uh, questions will be uh, uh, joined for both of you at the end of the session. Dr. Banerjee, you're muted. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello. Okay. Hi. So uh, I'm new to the GNE myopathy community. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dibendu Banerjee. I work at the Central Drug Research Institute, which is based out of Lucknow. Uh, so, so today, uh, I'm just trying to go full screen mode. Yeah. Okay. 
So today I'll be speaking about uh, screening-based identification of potential drugs for GNE myopathy. So until now you have heard about uh, the structure-based uh, studies being done, the uh, gene therapy studies that are being done. So we are also trying to start a, a screening-based identification of potential drugs for GNE myopathy. And at CDRI, we are uh, we have a, a, a database of uh, not a database but a real uh, bank of uh, drug-like molecules that we want to screen and see which one can work for the GNE myopathy. So, uh, well, all of you are very much familiar. I mean, this is just for me, you know, the background because I'm new to GNE myopathy. So. Uh, just uh, this is a autosomal recessive muscle disorder which is uh, formed due to mutations in both the gne myopathy genes and uh, uh, it affects the silic acid biosynthesis pathway uh, so we have to design a cell based we are trying to design a cell based assay where we can uh, we can uh, measure the amount of silylation on the surface of the cells. And by that measure, uh, if we add chemicals or compounds to the or drug like molecules to the cells, and if we can increase the levels of silylation uh, on the cell surface, that could be used as a marker for the kind of molecules that can aid the increase in silylation. So uh, this pathway where uh, CMP silic acid is uh, made requires the GNE protein to act at two different uh, steps. And finally, this uh, CMP silic acid gets uh, linked to the uh, cell surface here, to the glycoproteins on the cell surface and uh, leads to silylation of the uh, soil. Sorry about that. So this is what we are trying to measure in a fluorescence-based assay uh, in some cells on a petri plate. And we are trying to uh, we'll, we'll screen molecules that can increase the levels of silylation. In case the GNE gene is mutated, this pathway is not followed properly and the amount of silylation on the cell surface is less. So if we have some molecules now which can act on the uh, mutant GNE and increase the levels of silylation, they will be very good targets for uh, possible clinical therapies. So as you see, there are uh, several epigenetic uh, modifications also, the phosphorylation basically that happens uh, on the GNE gene. So we think that even epigenetic modulators can be helpful uh, in the, uh, as, as, as drugs. So, so we know that uh, null mutations of GNE are uh, lethal to the cells. So if we have uh, a cell-based assay, uh, we have to we have to knock out the gene from the from the cells and introduce the mutant uh, GNE, mutant and wild type GNE cells into into the cells. So we have two kinds of cells now, one expressing the wild type or the normal GNE uh, gene and the others that contain uh, the mutant uh, genes. So when you have the mutant GNE, some amount of GNE will be available to the cells and they will survive. The null, null uh, cells will survive because of the sialic acid present in the media. So they will keep the cells uh, alive for some time unless we can get the mutations until we can get the mutants to express in them. So uh, what, I've, what I have read is that uh, animal models of GNE myopathy do not faithfully recapitulate the human disease. So uh, testing uh, molecules in animal models uh, may not always give you the best possible uh, leads. So, uh, and anyway, before going to an animal model, you do need to find effective molecules in a cell-based assay. So that is what we are proposing to do. Uh, also, uh, 
you know, because GNE myopathy is primarily a disease of low sialic acid levels. Hence, theoretically, supplementation of the sialic acid or its precursor should provide relief. However, uh, from what I've read in clinical trials, uh, they have not found very encouraging uh, results if they are providing these uh, these these uh, the salic acid or uh, manosil uh, manase as the uh, precursors. Uh, so patients are not getting too much relief from the administration of these precursors. So therefore, uh, our approach is to find drug-like molecules in a cell-based assay using fluorescence. So uh, the key objective will be to develop a high throughput assay to quantify GNA gene function using fluorescently tagged lectin uh, that binds to the salic acid. So these fluorescent uh, FITC or sci 5 level lectins are available in the market. We can buy them and use them uh, for this assay. Uh, we can add them to the cell culture media and uh, they will be taken up by the cells and uh, they will then be, uh, they will then bind to the silic acid that is produced by the cells. So if it is a mutant cell, there will be less silic acid binding and if there, it is a wild type cell, there will be normal levels of silic acid uh, binding. So based on the level of salic acid binding, the fluorescence uh, increases or decreases and that can be measured by a fluorimeter. And uh, we can then uh, add the drug-like molecules that we want to screen and see if any of the drug-like molecules, you know, the, they can increase the levels of uh, salylations on the, uh, on the uh, fluorescent lectins. So uh, this, of course, will again also can also be measured by uh, the level of glycosylation can also be measured by a mass spectrometry or NMR-based methods to validate that there is the, indeed an uh, increase in the level of salylization. So uh, let me explain the objectives uh, briefly. Uh, we want to develop a cell-based high throughput assay where uh, we want to use a cell line called the HAP1, which are malignant neoplastic cells, which are derived from a patient with a chronic uh, myelogenous leukemia. So this uh, cell line is, this, uh, being a cancer cell line, it can divide continuously in culture and can be uh, used indefinitely for drug screening. So one culture, second culture, third culture, and so on. And you can keep on adding new, new drugs, uh, moieties to the cells and keep on screening them. So these uh, cells are, uh, unique because they are haploid and <coughs> they um, and uh, haploid for all the chromosomes. So humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes and these cells only carry one copy of each chromosome so that uh, it is easier to uh, introduce the, um, uh, the, the GNE gene into these cells for expression of the wild type or mutant uh, proteins. But uh, actually, we'll be using a completely uh, knockout uh, cell line, which will not have any single copy of the GNE gene inside of them. So there we will introduce uh, a copy of the GNE uh, construct containing the wild type protein or the mutant proteins and express them. And thereafter, we can add the uh, fluorescent labeled lectin to the media, which will be taken up by the cells. And then the, uh, depending on the level of silylation, the intensity of FITC lectin on the cell surface glycoproteins will be measured uh, in the presence of these drug-like molecules, uh, which may be able to affect the uh, level of silylation, uh, which we will measure. And then if you find a molecule that can increase it, that means that it is able to act on the gene gene and therefore, it is a good candidate for, uh, as, uh, for further testing as a drug. So uh, for the generation of the GNE mutant cell lines, uh, we'll begin with two important mutations uh, that were chosen by Professor Alok Bhattacharya because I think it, uh, uh, they are the most dominant mutations found in Indian patients. Later, we can also try other mutations if, our, if we succeed in our drug screening protocol. 
and the clones uh, will be made in a uh, plasmid vectors with a CMV promoter, which can express the uh, protein inside of the HEF1 cells. And uh, the mutant clones uh, will be generated by cell directed mutagenesis and confirmed by sequencing. Thereafter, the mutant clones will be transfected into these HEF1 cells. And then these cells containing the mutant GNE will be screened against thousands of drug-like molecules. Uh, <clears throat> so the protocol is as follows. Uh, the cells will be incubated for eight to 10 hours in a serum-free media. So there'll be no supply of uh, salic acid in the media. And after an incubation period of eight to 10 hours, the cell surface level of salic acids will be very, very low. And uh, in the mutant cells and uh, the, versus the wild type cells. So wild type cells can still produce their own uh, salic acid and, and the levels of salic acid on the cell surface will be normal. Whereas in the mutants, because there is no salic acid being provided to the cells and the cells are not able to produce the salic acid, so the uh, levels will be low. And this will be quantitated by a fluorescent lectin assay. Uh, so, and then when you uh, give molecules to the cells, uh, they, will, they may be able to increase the salic acid content in the gene mutant cells also. And this can be quantified by the uh, levels of salinization on the cell surface because of the fluorescent lectin present there. And therefore we'll be able to identify these molecules uh, as drug targets. So what we propose to do is that uh, CDRI has a repository of about 50,000 drug-like molecules. We'll screen all of them in a high throughput 96 plate format. So grow cells in, in plates uh, in 96 well plate format and uh, give one one drug each to each uh, well of the uh, cells and then see how it affects the uh, levels of salination. We also have access to the Leibniz compound library molecules and these can also be screened in a similar uh, cell based assay. We can also screen for chaperons or co chaperons and epigenetic modulators that can uh, lead to uh, functional and structural and functional changes to the GNE um, uh, protein and therefore uh, change their activity uh, maybe. And uh, of course we can also do in silico screening of compound libraries to begin with if structural, uh, structure based um, information is available uh, about the, the various domains of the protein and where a potential molecule can bind, then in silico screening can also be done to find molecules that will uh, go and bind to the active sites of the proteins and thereby uh, there may, they may be potential hits or molecules that can change the functioning of the uh, mutant gene protein. So uh, alternatively, we can also uh, purify the proteins from the HAP1 cells um, and then use the purified proteins uh, with in presence of the uh, drug-like molecules to, to use as the drug screen. So, uh, so two different approaches can be applied, but of course the cell-based assay is better because that shows that the molecules can actually enter the cells. So they are more likely to be active uh, in vivo, like in the patients. <clears throat> so therefore the compounds that can bind to GNE protein will be good candidates for further screening in advanced uh, activity-based screens, for example, maybe in uh, animal models first and then in uh, maybe in patients. So we are trying to uh, adopt a multi-pronged approach to enhance the possibility of finding at least a few drug-like molecules that can be taken ahead for advanced testing and analysis. Uh, the work is, work is still in the proposal stage. We have uh, approached CIPLA as well as we have uh, submitted a proposal to DBT for funding of this project. Uh, and uh, as soon as we uh, get some uh, funding, we will uh, start this project. So many people in CDRI, including me, uh, have been briefed about the importance of working on rare diseases 
and uh, the potential it has you know for uh, to give relief to the patients not just in india but to, to the whole world so we have a working team now in cdri uh, who are interested in the gne myopathy work and also other rare diseases and we hope to take this work ahead as soon as possible uh, thank you so much for listening thank you so much dr banish that was a very interesting talk um so we i think some of the questions have been answered uh, there there is one question for you dr banerji uh, are the silation enzymes in hgp1 cells similar to those found in skeletal muscles are the drugs no. in the library known to be cell permeable no the hapman cells do not uh, have any they will use uh, hapman cells that are actually knocked out for gn so they will not have any gn So in those, in that uh, knockout or null background, we will then introduce the human DNA uh, gene. So which will be, which can be a normal gene or a mutant that we want to study. So in that way, the human cells will have the human uh, have a human DNA gene expressing the protein. So they will then recapitulate the human disease. right uh, there was a question from dr gopal uh, uh we would also okay sorry that was an answer uh, i thought there was also a question um okay were there any other question there is a question from dr katoch yes dr katoch please yes sir so uh, this is a common question to both the colleagues you know they have i mean they have their design whatever they are trying to do if they succeed will have certainly a impact actually so I, i wish them good luck on that front i'm not questioning that see one point which all the the biology colleagues and even the clinicians should understand and you know they understand what they should focus see the disease takes 30 years 35 years 40 45 years to manifest so it is not the one to one action you know it is not the that is something is gone wrong in the gene and the resultant protein and the is is manifestation there's something beyond that actually so whatever therapies will come out they will have a very marginal effect only on the one one action one stop actually so they they are not going to change the total scenario actually disease manifestation has happened due to breakdown of several parallel things at the same time so i think uh, they, they should start you know looking at why, how the disease manifests does the why it manifested at such a late stage are there some other collateral pathways which are involved which are uh, again have to break down due to the nutritional factors due to the other factors which we learned understood by us so therapy is here is not one to one game that's how you know many those cyclic acid and those things didn't work actually so i wish them good luck but uh, if they have uh, they have already thought of such answers they are already investigating them they should but otherwise you know they should start investigating now itself because uh, that's my suggestion to all of them because i really we also i'm one of the well wishers who want them to succeed yes right sir but the good thing is small molecules is that they can be uh, given again and again without any problems yeah that patients, i agree that's that's the patients that's can take them all their lives no no that's okay that's once you get into that that can really make a difference if there are specific ones but right, the, but there's somewhere uh, yeah that's right, i agree with that there's a good 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 answer to yeah um i don't mangesh for your questions are answered i think your questions were answered right uh did anyone else have questions uh, before we move on with questions could i respect uh, could i request the panelists to please put their videos on uh, at least so that we can take one picture of both of you yeah sure thank you um yes did anyone else have questions Are there any other questions? Okay, so no other questions. So then I think, uh, and I, uh, maybe people will ask in the chat box later, or will privately message you. Um, so maybe you could check check your chat boxes. Uh, yes, sir. 
And so since we don't have uh, any more questions, I think we will go into a break now. Uh, so we have a 15 minute break till 12.35 when we start our next session. So in the meantime, those who have questions, and if I could request the uh, two panelists to please um, stay back in case people have questions, they can ask you during the break. For the rest sure. of the sure. Thank yeah. you. Thanks a lot. Actually, I, I wanted to add on to this is that uh, more molecules we have for, I mean, right now the number of molecules play, playing around with very few, it's an acetyl manosamine, and there's really no other molecule that we have in hand. Mm. So uh, if you have larger number of molecules, let's say 10 and 20 to play around from both the studies, then I am sure that we'll find a few out of them that may actually uh, uh, kind of meet the some of the requirements that we may have. And, and having more potential molecules is always the drug discovery case. It's a, it's a funnel, you know. You keep losing as you go higher, higher up uh, in terms of application. We need to start with a large number of molecules and we are hoping that uh, either direct screening or by through structural studies, we will be able to come out with molecules. Having molecules will help us to finally zero on to one or two, which could be potentially useful. Right now, we just don't have other than an acetyl yes, I wanted to add to uh, what Arjun said. Uh, that of course, uh, we, it's very hard to take a holistic approach. Uh, you know, we uh, try to look at the molecule uh, just from one angle. Uh, but uh, somewhere along the line, uh, depending on funding, we do uh, plan to do something like a metabolomic profile uh, of patients and then uh, try to understand what are the other metabolic uh, changes which are taking place in patients and uh, try to address the issue in a more holistic manner. But for the time being, uh, we have to use the simple approaches which we have uh, access to. If I could also respond, see, if you were to look at it uh, in the current day scenario, if you were to look at uh, Remdesivir, that comes from a structure. So this was a structure that people solved of the MERS virus, with, uh, uh, which had come, I think, almost two, three years ago. Of course, as uh, Professor Katosh points out, as Sudhaji points out, the, the fundamental limitation out here is even Remdesivir actually has limited utility and people talk about it uh, as, as being a beneficial only if it gets in at a certain stage and not earlier or later and thereabouts. So, the point we are trying uh, that uh, we've been trying to do in this particular disease per se would also require multiple strategies i suspect in parallel but for at least minimizing the number of potential therapeutics that can be at least tested or taken further that needs and i suspect with uh, this uh, the other aspect i suspect which is not very very clear is whether there is a clean high throughput assay that people can use. And that's something that we are working on. Yeah, I think both of you, the Dibindus thing, development, we are hoping that uh, HAP1 system will work and your the structure base. And, and interestingly, Dibindu has, they have this whole system, uh, high throughput assay system. Mm, so, so some of your assays can be done out there so oh, okay yes sure sure no i think it's a big plus of actually having us back to back out here because now that whoever gets a working good construct first which is stable mm. for the purified protein i think uh, it can be shared so yeah, you that, at least even with limited yes. budgets it, you know having knowing who else would be interested uh, we can pool uh, resources on that front and yeah. 
the, that's, that was, that, that's what our project is about, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, making the proteins. Anyway, so we'll uh, kind of look forward to that. And the other thing I want to add is that, um, uh, you know, the director of CDRI, Tapos, uh, is very keen in this project. And they have the CIPLA Center of uh, Rare Diseases, yeah, uh, Rare yeah. and Orphan Diseases. And I think it's very good that CDRI is getting part of a rare disease uh, drug discovery program. So far, they have not been. Mm -hmm. And this is also uh, increases the number of people that work on the system. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Shilpi, your next session starts at 12.35. 12.35? Yeah. Okay. Is Ram Kumar logged in? Yeah. I'm here. Hi. Hi. Can you see if you can share your slides? Yes. I'm going to do that right now. Thank you. Can you enable my screen sharing? That's what I was trying to ask my father if he has done it. Okay. <laughs> Baba? Yeah, he's yet to enable. Oh, Baba? Baba? You need to make Dr. Ram a co-host. I don't know why you can't hear. Baba, can you hear us? He's doing it. Yeah, now you should I'm, be able to. Yes, I'm able to. We'll start at 12.35 sharp. I'll be moderating the session for a few time. Sure. And both you and Dr. Koshik, we will, uh, I will message you in case you can see it uh, sure. when you have three minutes left. Okay. Yeah, sure. Everyone has been really good about time, so I haven't had to really do much. We'll stick to time. I missed out on the couple of talks, um, last couple of talks, because uh, I had to save power on my laptop. It's oh. unusual here uh, to have this long power cut. It never happened, but uh, today it had to. So. <laughs> Yeah, we were also hoping that this would not happen today for us. <laughs> I'm good. How are you? I'm fine. I'm fine. Looking forward to your talk. Yeah. yeah. And we were also hoping if, like, my, I was telling my mother, if, like, we could, from a patient perspective, understand muscle biology in a better way. Um, because it helps us with disease management just to know how our muscles regenerate and kind of just the biology of it. Yeah, so actually, okay. Ram, I was, uh, I was thinking that uh, you remember we were discussing about that muscle meeting. Yes. I think uh, we can do it online. There's no problem. Okay. Shall we go cool. ahead and you and I and Josna can organize this? Yeah, sure. That sounds good. Okay. Then next week I'll sort of write to both of you and we can fix up a date and get a list of speakers and then do it. I think we need to uh, look at all the people in India working on muscles because we also need, uh, you know, understand about muscles a lot <laughs> and there is yeah, whole absolutely. issues about skeletal muscles, smooth muscles and every muscle type, yeah, their regeneration yeah. and every issue. Yeah. So we'll, uh, I, I'll write a note next week and then we can take it forward. I mean, this, sure. this works out, uh, this video conferencing. 
kind of workout and now yeah. that we have got this experience of doing this yeah i've been yeah there have been sort of a lot of uh, embryology uh, talks that i've been attending mm. there is a gastrulation seminar series that's going and it's going really well these are uh, zoom talks uh, have become yeah uh, the way to go in these times and you don't have to travel to become uh, to attend to any of this <laughs> Yeah, and as Lale said, it is it's actually a blessing in disguise because we are able to actually listen to all of these talks that otherwise we wouldn't get a chance. Yeah. At these meetings, we don't get to go uh, so many meetings a year. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway. So. Okay, so we'll start now, yeah. Dr. Ram. Sure, uh, yeah, I'll get started. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So um, I will start my uh, presentation. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to tell you about uh, our efforts to develop cellular model for uh, GNE uh, myopathy. As uh, Sudha mentioned uh, in the morning, uh, my um, long-standing interest has been uh, muscle biology, and uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, we would be doing uh, with WWGM is to try and understand how the GNE affected, um, GNE myopathy affected muscle is different from the healthy muscle. And this understanding is going to be important for us to, uh, to come up with uh, 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 therapeutic interventions, novel therapeutic interventions than that exist today. And, uh, Sorry to interrupt yeah. but could you put this in slide share in the slide screen in the power in the sharing mode? I don't know what that mode is called. Okay, let me see. View it's gonna be slide only. Is it better? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Shilpi is probably asking you to full screen it. Full yes. screen. Okay, let me try that as well. Uh Sir, you can try F5, direct. F5, okay. Now. <laughs> no, this is not happening. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's, it's fine. Okay. Go with it. Yeah, uh, I have to play, zoom play, play, play button. All right, okay. So, um, yeah. So, before we actually get into doing this, which is to try and understand uh, the muscle biology uh, from, uh, for GNE uh, myopathy disease, it is important that we have access to uh, muscle cells that uh, have carry the GNE disease. Um, so uh, that is the primary objective uh, with which uh, we started working. Um, my association with WWGM actually started only um, uh, this uh, January, January 2020. Okay, so what I'm going to present today is mostly sort of uh, what we plan to do. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, we actually need uh, disease models, and we all know that uh, uh, preclinical studies uh, need uh, models uh, to study the disease. Um, these are, for example, uh, drug testing. Before we go into clinical trials, uh, you need to have uh, uh, models that replicate the disease uh, that you need to, uh, um, to uh, work with. And, uh, Animal models are used for drug testing and also for research because you need to perform experiments to understand how the disease is affecting uh, the muscle tissue. So um, there are mouse models that are available for GNE myopathy. There are quite a few, um, a bunch of muscle ma mouse models that are available. But uh, all these models uh, have taught us quite a few about GNE myopathy, but they don't uh, sort of... Um, replicate the disease in all aspects. And so there is always a requirement for a better model. And, uh, and another issue is uh, there are differences, species uh, differences, uh, uh, species specific differences that are always between uh, uh, the disease uh, uh, biology. So uh, you also need actually a human 
uh, uh, model that is uh, required for understanding the disease. So um, muscle cells uh, with gene mutation in the petri dish, uh, if you can generate that, um, uh, which is of human origin, that will be a very close model that we can have for studying the disease. So you can, uh, this is the uh, major interest that we have currently, which is to generate muscle cells that will carry gene mutation and that we can study and also potentially use for drug testing in future. So two types of cell-based cell -based models or cellular models are, are possible. One is actually to get muscle cells from the patients. So this would involve uh, taking muscle biopsy from the patients and, uh, and then plating them on the petri dish. Uh, the, the problem with this approach, as you can see, first of all, it requires muscle biopsy from patients. Uh, who already are sort of losing the muscle mass. And two, even if you do that, uh, you cannot maintain these muscle cells in the dish obtained from patients for very long. Uh, maybe a few days and maximum a few weeks, and then these cells will, will die in the dish. And the number of cells that you get from this kind of model uh, is uh, very limited. So the number of experiments that you can perform with this kind of model is also very uh, minimal. So there is a recent uh, development in, in, the, in the stem cell field that uh, has uh, allows the development of a cell-based uh, model, disease model, that will uh, eliminate all these uh, uh, sort of disadvantages with the first model that I said. So this is known, the, the, the model is known as the induced pluripotent stem cell uh, uh, based system. Um, so here, again, you can get uh, cells, for example, skin biopsies, or you can draw blood from the patient. And using these cells, generate what are called induced pluripotent stem cells. I'll come to it in the next slide. So first, I'll, we'll see what is the advantage of the system it's you take blood or skin so you don't have to go to the muscle of the patient and and the induced pluripotent stem cells that you generate from these blood or or skin cells of the patient can be maintained indefinitely in culture and and so it provides you a limitless supply of cells that you can use and as you can see you will be starting with uh, blood or skin cells but our interest is here to study muscle. So you have to make muscle cells out of the, uh, uh, the cells that you obtained from the patient. And this is the major challenge in this, uh, in this uh, system of induced pluripotent stem cells. So very briefly, um, as I said, uh, you take uh, uh, patient cells, uh, blood for example, and plate the blood cells in the, in the dish and introduce these four genes that are listed here, KLF4, MAKE, OCT4, and, and SOX2. So uh, introduction of these genes into the cells, uh, uh, it's kind of hitting the rewind button of the video. Okay. okay. Wherever the video, let's say you finished watching the movie, you hit the rewind button, you can go all the way back to the start of the movie, right? Very similarly, even though these are specialized cells like blood or skin, the moment you add these four genes and you culture them in the, in the lab for a while, they kind of attain this property. They, hit, they get reprogrammed or sort of get the rewind button. Uh, it's like pushing the rewind button. They go back to uh, where they came from. It's like the cells in the embryo from which all these cells are generated. So this is what we refer to as uh, pluripotent cell because it's, it is capable of generating now any type of cell in the body. So you've taken blood and introduced these genes and pushed the rewind button back and so now you have got cells, embryo-like cells that is capable of making any cell type uh, that you want. Okay and this is the uh, sort of uh, this is the the method was developed in 2007. It has revolutionized the field because now you can generate any cell type of potentially generate any cell type of interest uh, in, the, in the dish, and that will serve as a um, source of uh, a disease model. For example, if you derive the uh, blood from the patient. Now, 
um, as I said, um, you've gotten these induced pluripotent stem cells, which are like uh, uh, cells in the embryo, but you need to now uh, push these cells to make muscle in the dish. And this has actually, uh, uh, is the challenge that I will I'll talk to you in the next slide. So we don't have to ourselves make these uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. There is an uh, induced pluripotent stem cell uh, derived from GNE myopathy patient that is available from a cell bank in, in Japan. And we plan to obtain this cell from them to, to uh, uh, do the uh, carry out the project. Okay, so um, as I said, the major challenge in using the induced pluripotent stem cell approach is to derive a muscle cell from the induced pluripotent stem cells with a great efficiency. You need to have lots of muscle cells uh, that you can derive from uh, the embryo-like pluripotent stem cells. So um, um, the it's only five years uh, since that we, that we have actually a protocol that uh, or a method that allows a derivation of uh, muscle tissue, skeletal muscle tissue from uh, pluripotent stem cells. Uh, this work came from, uh, from uh, Olivier Pourquier's lab. So in the last, actually uh, it has been three to four years that uh, uh, our own lab generated uh, also uh, uh, a designed uh, a method for derivation of skeletal muscle from pluripotent stem cells. And, uh, and we have actually done it with the uh, mouse uh, uh, origin, pluripotent uh, stem cell. Now, uh, the major uh, focus uh, uh, in the lab is to, is to uh, replicate this success that we have had with the mouse system in the uh, human system. So basically it involves, uh, it, you need to understand the developmental biology of the muscle very well, which is what uh, we do in the lab. And based on this uh, knowledge of the developmental pathway, you need to uh, stepwise uh, sort of push nudge these cells towards making uh, muscle in the dish. Okay. So um, what, um, as I said, we have started uh, in, in February, 2020. This is uh, the project started uh, in February 2020, and unfortunately was cut short because uh, the uh, I said the Rupati shut down uh, mid March. But uh, in that short period, uh, with uh, Suleika, who is uh, a postdoc in the lab, uh, we've uh, made some some progress. Uh, first of all, um, uh, we have a, the the first step in the project is to establish an efficient method to derive muscle from human pluripotent cells so that when we obtain this, this cell line that is uh, already uh, generated in Japan, we'll be able to make use of it to derive muscle so that we can study the muscle. So uh, in preparation for all these work, we have already obtained uh, the, the stem cell uh, approval. It's a statutory approval that we need to get in order to work with human pluripotent stem cells uh, that we have obtained. And we've also obtained a, a human, uh, uh, another pluripotent cell. While we are waiting for the uh, disease patient derived uh, pluripotent cell, we have uh, gotten another pluripotent cell so that we can get uh, started with the with the, uh, generating the method uh, for uh, deriving muscle. So um, until the shutdown, we've actually managed to do a number of experiments that uh, allowed us to get past this initial uh, hiccups. So usually human uh, pluripotent stem cells are notorious. They die very easily the moment you push them towards differentiation. So we have managed to get past that stage and we've been able to successfully uh, um, put them in differentiation media for a long time. So uh, this is all I have got in terms of, uh, of uh, results to, uh, to show you in the one and a half months that we've been uh, able to do. So what is the, uh, what is the plan? Um, so the plan is to get the patient derived cells uh, from, from Riken, the, the cell bank that is already there. And uh, the gene correction uh, of the gene mutation will be done, I think, in uh, CSAR IgIB uh, laboratory. And so basically, as you can see in the slide, you will have patient specific iPSC, the pluripotent cell, and gene corrected iPSC. This will give us the comparison. We'll have diseased muscle 
by pushing, pushing the IPS2 differentiate into muscle and also the uh, healthy uh, isogenic muscle cells. This will uh, allow us to compare the diseased and healthy muscles side by side and, and understand how the, uh, the muscle disease muscle is different from the healthy muscle. And uh, eventually, the same system can be used for drug screening, drug screening as well. Okay, so I'll I'll stop there and uh, I'll take uh, uh, questions. Or questions will be at the end of the session. Thank you so much, Dr. Ram, um, and um, we hope that you can continue this work um, soon. And maybe you could tell us later about when you are when you expect to be able to start start with this work again. Um, next, I would like to invite Dr. Koshik. Um, yeah, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, okay, so I'll share my screen. We can't see your screen. Okay, just a second. You see it now? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Is it uh, full screen? It's not full screen. Okay. All right. Now? Huh? Yes, perfect. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, it's uh, and thank you, Olga, for uh, this uh, invitation and this platform to present the work. And uh, WWGM has uh, supported uh, this part of work for us. And uh, so what we, uh, it, it'll be a bit of continuation from what Ram had been talking about. Uh, and thank you, Ram, for giving a nice introduction to IPACs. And uh, what we want to do here is basically uh, use the IPAC, patient-derived IPACs that we were generating from the patients. Uh, Blood and to study and understand the mechanism, how exactly uh, the uh, myopathy begins so that we can identify molecules to address it. So as uh, Ram pointed out, so there is a need for experimental model as, or the cell cellular model in a dish uh, for GNA myopathy, which would complement the animal models, uh, basically to have in human context uh, for the molecular and physio to understand the molecular and physiological prophenotypes of the disease as such. And uh, as the Pindu had said, one can use these uh, muscle cells that have come from the patient derived IPACs to uh, identify newer molecules for therapeutic. So, yeah, so this is a technique. Jisay aap kya karsate ho ki जो सेल कोई सभी आप ब्लड ले लो या स्किन से ले लो जिससे इसको लेके आप रीक प्रोग्राम कर सकते हो जैसे डॉक्टर राम ने बताया कि इसको आप स्विच बैक कर सकते हो जैसे कि ये प्लूरीपोटेंट स्टेम सेल बन जाता है तो प्लूरीपोटेंट का ये है कि आप इससे कोई सभी सेल बना सकते हो सो बट इट्स नॉट इट्स नॉट अ वेरी स्ट्रेट तो इसमें आपको रिप्रो कुछ फैक्टर्स डालने होते हैं बाहर से वायरस के द्वारा या नॉन वायरल भी आप ऐड कर सकते हो सो जिसे ये करीबन एक महीने लग जाते हैं एक डेढ़ महीने लग जाते हैं जिसे आप इसको प्लूरीपोटेंट स्टेम सेल्स बनते हैं तो ये प्लूरीपोटेंट स्टेम सेल्स जो हैं तब इसको कैरेक्टराइज करना पड़ता है कि ये सारे इसमें जो खूबियाँ होनी चाहिए प्लूरीपोटेंट स्टेम सेल्स के इस इज देयर और नॉट तो आपको वो देखना होता है कि ये डिवाइड कैसे हो रहे हैं, ग्रो कैसे हो रहे हैं, और ये बहुत नाजुक से सेल हैं, दे बेसिकली आप कभी भी इसको मतलब दूसरे सेल्स की तरह इसको हैंडल भी कर पाओगे, तो इसको बहुत ही यू नो केयर लेना होता है, तो एंड देन यू डिफरेंशिएट देम टुवर्ड्स, तो दिखाया गया है, सो लोगों ने इनको इन टूरिपोटेंट काफी सारे स्टडीज करते हैं जैसे कि ड्रग टेस्टिंग कर लेते हैं और ट्रांसलेशन भी हो रहा है जहाँ पे ये पेशेंट्स को दिया जा रहा है लेकिन 
it's just started now so there are a lot of uh, things that is yet to be weeded out found ki isko kaise safely dala jaye and this is what has been to work on and what we want to do here is to drive these ipscs patient derived ipscs jo hum bana rahe hain to skeletal muscles to isme do challenge hai ek to ye ipsc banna jo ipsc easily bante nahi hai kyunki pura jo reprogramming process hai ye kafi complicated sa hai so uh, isme partial reprogramming hote hain to next whenever you want to have that as a uh, uh, pluripotent stem cell so it takes a very long time for the actual characterization it takes at least about 6 months to a year to actually come to that point where you can use that pluripotent characterized stem cells to become uh, any cells that you want to generate jahan pe yahan pe hum log kya kar rahe hain ki skeletal muscle banane ki koshish pe hain to aise ye jo paddhati hai pluripotent stem cells ko मसल सेल्स बनाने का ये करीबन एक डेढ़ महीने का होता है और इसको बनाने के लिए जो आ, काफी सारे बाहर से हम लोगों को प्रोटीन रिकॉमेंट प्रोटीन जो होते हैं उनको ऐड करना पड़ता है स्मॉल मॉलिक्यूल्स बोल के कुछ चीजें होती है उनको ऐड करना पड़ता है बट गोल ये होता है कि ये स्टेम सेल्स बने स्टेम सेल्स को हम स्केटल मसल्स बनाए तो इसमें दे हैज बिन समाउंट ऑफ वर्क दैट इज गॉन इन टू दिस एंड कई सारे प्रोटोकॉल्स हैं जिससे आप ये प्लूरिपोर्टेंट स्टेम सेल्स को मसल सेल्स बना सकते हो बट ये जितने भी पद्धतियां हैं जो प्रोटोकॉल्स हैं ये सारे हम लोगों को माउस सेल से मिला है या माउस वर्क पे जो इंसानों पे जब वेन यू वॉन्ट टू ट्रांसफर दैट इन टू द ट्रांसलेट इन टू ह्यूमन वर्क उसमें काफी सारे दिक्कतें हैं बिकॉज वी देर लॉट ऑफ ब्लाइंड स्पॉट इन देर सो वी हैव टू वर्क ऑन दैट एंड एज आई सेट इज अ चैलेंज so this is where the process how it goes on to differentiate a pluripotent stem cells and these are the different steps jahan pe myoblast hai aur uske baad at the end you have myotubes and what we call as myocytes so we have uh, at least shortlisted couple of protocols to work on and uh, the point here is once we have the muscle cells usko obviously you want to say that uh how good are they so we have to characterize and understand them and uh, follow them up by different techniques so isme hum log kafi sare markers dekhte hain ki ye muscle cells sahi mein banaye hai ya nahi banaye to niche jo dekh rahe ho aap ye to timeline ho gaya ki itne time lagte hain ipsc se shuru hota hai aur muscle cells banane mein kareeb 1 1 1 mahine ka protocol hai ye and these are the different uh, genes that we will look into so see if it has been a characteristic uh, muscle cells that we are deriving from the ipscs and uh, by different techniques uh so how does i just walk you through how we are making it so yahan pe kya hota hai so dr nelni se uh, we have got some uh, blood from uh, different gne pa- or gne patients with different mutations for example we have uh, roma gypsy and homozygous and founder mutations jinse hum bana rahe hain तो इनके ब्लड जो लिए हम लोग हम लोग रिमैन से सो वी आर कन्वर्टेड और मेड दो ब्लड से हम लोग वी मेड पीबीएमसीज जो पीबीएमसीज का मतलब ये होता है कि दे आर ए टाइप ऑफ ब्लड सेल्स जिनको पेरिफेरल ब्लड मोनोन्यूक्लियर सेल्स कहते हैं एंड वंस वी आइसोलेट दिस पीबीएमसीज फ्रॉम द ब्लड वी डी प्रोग्राम दम यूजिंग ए नॉन इंटीग्रेटिंग मेथड टू जनरेट दिस आई पी सो ये नॉन इंटीग्रेटिंग मेथड ये होता है कि इसमें जो प्रोसेस uh, है जो प्रक्रिया है इसमें इसको रिप्रोग्रामिंग करते वक्त कोई मैनिपुलेशन जो होता है तो इसमें कोई डीएनए डीएनए का इंसर्शन नहीं होता है तो इसमें वो अदर प्रॉब्लम्स जो बाद में हो सकता है वो नहीं होता है सो वी आर यूजिंग सेंडाई वायरस अप्रोच ऑफ रिप्रोग्रामिंग दिस पीवीएमसी टू आई एंड वंस यू सी आपको जो यहाँ पे पिक्चर दिखाया जा रहा है तो ये है आई ऐसे दिखते हैं आई तो उसके बाद आई मिलने के बाद इसको कैरेक्टराइज uh, करते हैं कि ये सही में आई इंड्यूस टू रिपोर्टेंट स्टेम सेल्स है या नहीं और ये जो कलर्ड पिक्चर दिख रहा है आपको दिस इज बेसिकली पिक्चर ऑफ कैरेक्टराइजिंग दीज आई पी एस बाई डिफरेंट मार्कर्स सो हमने यहाँ पे कई सारे ऐसे मार्कर्स uh, यूज किए रखे हैं जिससे हमको पता चलता है कि ये जो सेल्स बनाए हैं हमने ये आई पी है या नहीं तो आई पी एस कुछ हम बना रहे हैं पेशेंट्स के जैसे मैंने बता रहा हूँ आपको और ये चैलेंज है और वी आर इन द प्रोसेस ऑफ मेकिंग डिफरेंट पेशेंट डिराइव आई पी एस सी लाइन साइमिलटेनियसली वी आर ऑल्सो वर्किंग ऑन प्रोटोकॉल डेवलपमेंट ऑफ डिफ्रेंशिएटिंग दिस आई पी एस सी टू स्केलेटल मसल्स 
सो एज अपसेट देर आर कपल ऑफ मेथड वी आर ट्राइंग आउट सो इसमें दो मेथड हम आप ट्राई कर रहे हैं करेंटली तो एक है इट्स अबाउट ए मंथ एंड अदर इज अबाउट ट्वेंटी टू डेज एंड इट इनकॉर्पोरेट्स डिफरेंट मीडिया एंड एडिंग डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ फैक्टर्स ओवर अ पीरियड ऑफ टाइम और ये डिफ्रेंशिएटिंग करते वक्त द प्रॉब्लम इज लाइक एज डॉक्टर राम इज सेट दर लॉर्ड ऑफ सेल्स मतलब काफी दिक्कतें होती बिकॉज द सेल्स आर वेरी स्ट्रेस्ड ये इजिली डिफ्रेंशिएट नहीं होते एंड वट इंटरेस्टिंग यू वी फाउंड आउट इज दैट अगर हम इन सेल्स को तो आपको बताता हूँ मैं यहाँ पे आपको लेफ्ट में जो दिख रहा है ये स्टैंडर्ड जैसे डिफ्रेंशिएट करते हैं वैसे इसको टू डी कहते हैं जैसे नीचे एक परत होता है जिसको मेट्रीजल कहते हैं तो उसके ऊपर वो सेल्स ग्रो होते हैं आईपीएसी और मीडिया जो होता है तो वो दैट इज प्रोवाइड द न्यूट्रिशन टू दी सेल्स एंड ड्यूरिंग द डिफ्रेंशिएशन पीरियड वी फाउंड आउट कि अगर हम हम उसके उस सेल्स के ऊपर और एक परत मेट्रीजल के डाल दें जिसको हम थ्री डी ओवरले कहते हैं उससे यू हैव बेटर ग्रोथ ऑफ दीज सेल्स एंड दिस सर्वाइव बेटर आई विल शो यू हियर दैट हमने इसको स्टैटिस्टिक्स देख के हमने क्वांटिफाई किए हैं तो आप मेथड वन एंड टू में देखोगे तो ये दो मेथड हैं और नीचे आपको थ्री डी का ग्राफ दिखाई दे रहा है सो इन थ्री डी जिसपे मेट्रीज का परत है उसमें हमें बेटर मार्कर्स जैसे ब्राचुरी है डिफ्रेंसिएशन प्रोटोकॉल जो है इसको और रोबस्ट ताकि हमें और भी अच्छे फीचर की स्केलेटल मसल सेल्स मिले इसकी कोशिश जारी है सो या सो दैट इज व्हाट आई वांट टू से एंड आई वुड लाइक टू थैंक आवर टीम दिस आवर टीम ग्रो लैब जहां पे मैं काम करता हूं और ये है मेरे फंडर्स थैंक यू फॉर योर अटेंशन Thank you so much, Dr. Koshik. Um, that was also a very interesting talk. Um, so I think there were some questions for Dr. Ram in the chat box. Dr. Ram, did you uh, have a chance to look at them? And then, uh, if people would like to ask uh, Dr. Koshik questions, you can either raise your hand or type it in the chat box. Yeah. So uh, thanks, uh, Shilpi. And uh, yeah, I saw the the questions. and first of all yeah thank you kaushik so much i think this is fantastic to see that you are you are you are also doing a uh, uh, ipc derivation as well as a uh, derivation of skeletal muscle from ipcs it will be uh, great to sort of uh, um, get together and then and then uh, see uh, what we can do together absolutely so that we can speed things up. yeah yeah so dr kaushik can you put your camera on now so that we can see both of you if it's sure good. sure so there is this uh, question from uh, kasturi pal which is is it possible to immortalize muscle cells um so uh, for example by re removing the apoptotic genes and also sort of uh, introducing uh, genes like uh, uh, mic um i think uh, it is actually there are uh, mouse uh, myoblasts uh, that are available that have been immortalized so these are cell lines that are available like the c2c12 or the L6 line that is uh, from rat, uh, so yes, it is possible to uh, to do that, and uh, and I think uh, in the in the event that uh, the so there is a ceiling. Uh, the so far people have been getting 40% myogenesis in the dish. Uh, if uh, we are able to sort of improve that, uh, then I think this is the IPSC uh, method is far uh, better. Yeah. I would prefer this. Instead, instead of making sort of more modifications to the to the myoblast and use, uh, but yeah, that is still something that we can we can keep it as a possibility. And there is also a question from Alok, which is: Is it possible to use the human muscle cells derived from human embryonic stem cells for testing uh, gene therapy vectors? Um, uh, yes, um, 
the, the short answer is yes, depending on what, uh, what one would want to actually uh, test. In terms of uh, um, uh, the level of expression that you would get, for example, of the transgene, and, uh, and uh, if we are able to see any, um, any assayable phenotype, uh, in the in the genie uh, uh, muscles, then uh, yes, of course, this will be uh, this will be a useful setup for for testing the gene therapy vectors as well. I I just uh, uh, taking up what Munia was saying and uh, this thing. Yeah. First thing is that uh, she hasn't tested her system into uh, you know in muscle cells. Uh, human muscle cells would be. You know, you're simply wild type uh, embryonic stem cells that you have, muscle derived from there. Mm -hmm. It can be a good testing ground for both. Yeah, the I, missed, uh, I missed Munia. So, what is the issue? What is it that she would like to test, especially in terms she of. She has uh, a. Uh, Munia has this, uh, um, you know, non viral vector system that she has tested in skin cells and she hasn't mm -hmm. really. Uh, 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 has tested gene transfer into a non, uh, I mean, into muscle cells. And I think uh, she could try it out on that. And also we could yeah, that potentially, be... both you and Kaushik, we can potentially also check the, uh, uh, the, the new promoter that, uh, it's not a new one, the promoter that uh, Arka was talking about, just to see the efficiency of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that can certainly be done with uh, with this. Um, so yeah, human muscle we we still have to uh, make in in our lab. Um, we have made successfully. Uh, yeah. So so and also in the long run, I mean, for the drug screening project, if we can eventually, I, I still it's a long way to go. Eventually generate a GNE. Uh, you know, gene deletion mutant, mm. okay? And then express from outside uh, a mutant protein or a wild type protein, you know, having that as an episomally expressed protein. Yeah, so I think that would be, yeah. What that we are planning be. to with HAP1 cells, can we do that with muscle cells? I think all of that, that should be the way to go about because once uh, we have these muscle cells coming from different uh, patient-derived IPACs. Mm. Can, we can use them as a screen mm. uh, to see exactly how it, because it will be the very closest to the, uh, the phenotype, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, compared to adding anything exogenous, whatever we add, and then there are a lot of other issues where it is getting integrated and whatnot and what other, uh, other effects it has. So if it is just something lesser, it's manipulated, better it is. And uh, although it is going through a lot, uh, so it will be a good more thing to have a look at those cells and see uh, how exactly, especially the screen that uh, Dipendu is working on. Uh, that would be really interesting to see how these lines, uh, these skeletal muscles from different lines are behaving to that, to the different molecules. So that will give us a nice idea, actually. Um, yeah, Kaushik, there are a couple of questions for you on the chat box. If you... Okay, I'll just... Yeah, I'll address them. Thank you, Ram. Thanks for pointing. So, Neetu, uh, if you can hear me, so you're asking, like, can we use these IPACs for treatment and when? Now, uh, so the thing with these IPACs for treatment, you have to obviously differentiate them. Uh, so, if you're talking about personalized medicine, so please remember that whatever these skeletal muscles that are generated, they will still have that mutation in it. So, that has to be looked into. So uh, if you're putting this uh, same mutation, I mean, the skeletal muscles, person, in the case of personalized medicine, if the skeletal muscle still carries that mutation. So uh, I don't know what, how much benefit will that be pro providing. So here, uh, the, uh, where the cell therapy meets gene therapy comes into big play, I guess, uh, where you will have to correct those uh, mutations and then put the uh, rectified skeletal muscle cells back for regenerative purpose for therapy, as you are what you're asking. Uh, one very key point here is at what stage should we harvest these 
uh, muscle cells is a question because if they are a very mature cell, then transplantation or integration is, is an issue, right? Uh, so that's something uh, I think the whole community, we have to work on that. Uh, but for sure, what uh, for time being, we can use as soon as we have it ready uh, for screening those small, you know, all these uh, small molecules and the drug library uh, for sure. So that will at least give us something go on forward. Um, yeah, can I add something to what Koshik was saying uh, for Neetu's question? So uh, the question of um, uh, putting in IPC derived or ES derived myoblasts for therapy uh, uh, comes uh, with the rider that you actually have lost enough muscle mass that needs to be built up. So with gene therapy, you can correct the uh, remaining cells, but if you have lost so much muscle mass that even with the correction, the remaining muscles cannot generate enough force, then you need to have a means of providing additional muscle. And that's where IPS or ES derived myoblasts come in. So for those patients who are further down the line, uh, I guess this would be an additional route of therapy. Yeah, um, I would like to add uh, um, on top of that as well. So people have been trying to do this even for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And so myoblasts, when introduced into, uh, when transplanted, they, they undergo apoptotic death. So uh, this was already done in 1980s. And uh, so uh, research in the stem cell field suggests that you have to transplant um, quiescent muscle stem yeah. cells, not uh, proliferating uh, myoblasts. So if you are able to generate PAC7 positive uh, stem cells in this IPSC uh, system, then, uh, then that would be the source. So uh, the challenge would be to generate PAC7 positive cells in large number. Uh, after in correction, and uh, and so that is uh, that's the great limiting step. Yeah, yeah. Recently, there's been some success from Catherine Wagner's group. So, yeah, for the MD. So, so there's some uh, exciting new things happening in terms of protocol development for that. Exactly. So, just to add on there, so they have been using myoblast for that uh, DMD study. Uh, but they uh, use the, uh, for transplanting. Now, yeah, so we, that has to be really looked on. Hmm. So there's another question. How long it take muscle fiber to regenerate in any kind of uh, trials? Um, I don't fully really understand. How long will it take for the muscle fiber to regenerate? So... Yeah, if you are adding, if this question pertains to addition of uh, of uh, stem cells, and uh, and uh, and then how long from there after the addition that it'll take for it to regenerate, um, this is uh, yeah, this depends on the um, uh, how extensive the myopathy is, what are the muscles that are uh, being affected, and uh, and so typically these are. Um, um, intra-arterial or intravenous delivery. So the cells are supposed to home in the, the, into the various muscle tissues and regenerate. Um, so uh, typical muscle regeneration is, uh, is 21 days after injury. Um, but, uh, but it's a question of building up muscle mass in all the muscles that have been affected and that may take uh, uh, longer. There was a question my mother also had for Koshik, Dr. Koshik. Any more information about fibrocytes? Yeah, I just wrote to her saying that no, we have not followed it up. That's a very interesting uh, thing that we came across, uh, but we couldn't really follow up much on that. Really hope to do more on that. Yeah. Yeah, that did seem like interesting data. Yes, yes, yes. Very much so. Very much so. Any other questions? 
Neetu has hand up. Neetu? Yes, Shilpi, I want to, I want to ask a question to Dr. Moore. Yes, please. Go ahead, Neetu. Uh, hello? Dr. Ghosh? Yes. I'm yes. Dr. Ghosh, I was asking you to ask 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 हाँ तो दिस इज़ वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू आंसर मतलब ये आसानी से हम आंसर नहीं कर पाएंगे लेकिन मतलब जो हमें बाकी एनिमल मॉडल से पता है फॉर एग्जांपल ये मैं डीएमडी के केस में कह सकता हूँ इन डीएमडी आपको सिर्फ 20 प्रतिशत एक्सप्रेशन चाहिए जो नॉर्मल बच्चे का है उसका 20 प्रतिशत उसी से आपको थ so, how much do you need to do in GNE? I don't know because there are no studies that have been done. But in general, if you look at muscle diseases, the trend is between 20-50% of the expression, then the fourth generation comes back. And in this case, this is not directly related to fourth generation, the glycosylation, probably alpha dystroglycan, फंक्शन अगर आ गया तो तो इन डेट केस डी डी ट्रीटिंग फिजिशियन रियली नीड्स टू मतलब उनको देखना पड़ेगा कि कितना डिजेनरेशन हुआ है क्या क्या आप कर सकते हैं इवन इफ यू आर मतलब आप व्हीलचेयर बाउंड हो तो भी आप क्या क्या कर सकते हैं उसके ऊपर डिपेंड करेगा कि जीन थेरेपी आपको कितनी मदद कर सकता है तो अब ये तो है ही सही बात कि at very late stage कोई भी type का therapy चाहे gene therapy हो cell therapy हो drug therapy हो जो भी हो उसका असर बहुत ही कम रहेगा तो in those cases maybe combination help करेगा पता नहीं लेकिन individual patient को देखके उनका जो भी मसल टेस्ट है उनके रिजल्ट्स देखके तो ही पता चलेगा कि ये जीन थेरेपी के लिए आइडियल कैंडिडेट हैं कि नहीं हैं तो इसलिए मैंने मेरे स्लाइड्स में भी वो बताया था कि जो क्लिनिशियंस हैं उनको चेक करना पड़ेगा सारे पेशेंट्स को ट्रायल्स में एनरोल करने के पहले कि कौन सबसे बेनिफि� ये स्टडी आने में कितना टाइम लगेगा सर? ये शिल्पी आंसर करेगी। नीतू, यू नो दैट इट्स वेरी मच डिपेंडेंट ऑन फंडिंग एंड लाइक वी आर हैविंग प्रॉब्लम्स गेटिंग दैट राइट द आल्सो बिकॉज़ द पेशेंट कम्युनिटी इज़ नॉट दैट एक्टिव एस कंपेयर्ड टू अदर्स, सो वी इट हैज़ टू आल्सो कम मोर how much minimum requirement will be funding? I think that is something that we can maybe discuss later because that is something that is something that we have to discuss amongst ourselves. But what I understand is that it will be in crores, the amount needed. And right now we are collecting money in lakhs, right? So we have to like triple four times the amount that we are collecting right now. And that too, the money we are collecting is mostly, really to be honest, Neetu, it's just me. Okay, most of the money that's come, it's been people I know and like in large quantities. And I, it has to, to get money in crores, we have to like really step up our game many, many more times. Okay, thank you. Can I can I ask a, a question which uh, uh, which uh, maybe people here could uh, help me with? So one thing that I do um, um, read is that uh, there is no regenerative response that is noticed in 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 GNE uh, myopathy muscles. Um, have there been sort of more recent studies that show any regenerative response? Have clinicians noticed any regenerative response? Because this says that the, the stem cells are not being uh, um, being uh, sort of recruited or mobilized to, to regenerate the uh, atrophying muscle. 
and uh, and understanding this would be important to to even consider cell therapy the ips mediated uh, uh, cell therapy eventually if you are making stem cells uh, if the stem cell existing stem cells are not mobilized then will the addition of cells uh, uh, from outside will it help right so uh, does anyone know um, more about the lack of regenerative response in gne gne myopathy uh, that's one area that has really not you know unfortunately there are not too many this thing muscle biology has not been studied for example we don't know why skeletal muscles get affected and not smooth muscles and mm-hmm. if we really look at it jni uh, and we looked at that jni uh, and the whole pathway of 43 43 genes not only direct and indirect most of the genes are expressed at a lowest level in muscle skeletal muscle compared to others so we don't even know why skeletal muscles what is the regenerative pot- potential of satellite cell mm-hmm. what i mean these are the things that we need to actually study you know so and it will be very very interesting uh, for example if you can look at uh, uh, what happens when you create a gene mutation uh, to see whether you can if you can for example if you can generate a mouse model where we can treat it with a uh, you know ips cells and see whether we can populate uh, the muscles mm. and and in situ or you know a niche based uh, differentiation of ips into muscle cells and whether the mutation effects all these thing needs to be studied we just don't know what will happen even if we take a satellite cells and correct gene and put it back we don't know whether it will work or not so do we do we know first of all if if satellite cells are found in in no that i i haven't not, seen any data i was looking for it i haven't seen any data is, nobody has looked at it this is surprising because um yeah this is one of the first things to look at because not signaling is critical for maintenance of satellite cells yeah, cell stem yeah that's right and and not just heavily glycosylated so i don't know if it is sil- uh, silylated Mm. Uh, but uh, but uh, yeah so not in the absence of not signaling uh, the stem cells actually begin to differentiate and uh, and so over a period of time you would be completely be depleting the the muscle of uh, of uh, satellite cells mm. so this is one thing to to look at so and and other thing is that it's a adult onset so what is happening first 20 years mm. you don't see that why you yeah. see later on so th- those is, is those are the scientific to... question that and mm-hmm. i think they are great science i think they are good science and would also have an effect on mm. so i think we'll uh, we'll do the muscle meeting and yeah. we'll discuss some of these issues and see whether some of you can all get together and work on this absolutely and yeah. then the last ram uh, that you know about the quiescent muscle stem cells Uh, in case there are some quiescent st- stem cells in the gni myopathy patients uh, is there any way to activate them uh, by externally uh, you know by any molecules so um, i think um, that is one of the directions that uh, that uh, that uh, the um, other uh, dystrophy uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, people who are studying other dystrophies are also thinking about which is to activate the existing sort of uh, satellite cells um i don't know if it is something that we know again if you if you um sort of um modulate the not signaling pathway it is possible to activate them because that is what keeping them quiet but as we were discussing with the unlock it is first of all important to see what is the status with respect to uh, muscle stem cells in gni myopathy uh, muscles those muscles that are involved because uh, you um, it is important probably to look at the mouse models to understand the the progression uh, from early stages because if you've lost the muscle stem cells over a period of time and which is why there is no response to uh, uh, the continuing atrophy because you don't have any more muscle uh, stem cells uh, to respond to uh, then also then the situation is different then you have to extraneously supply um, 
So also I was interested because the uh, some level of exercise helps. And uh, exercise can do two things. One is to activate the, the muscles themselves because that is how people put on, um, uh, people build muscle, right? But weightlifting is not something that is, that is uh, 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 should be, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, prescribed for, for genie patients. That's what I read. And, uh, and so sort of uh, other kind of uh, 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 exercise is, is, is uh, suggested. So two things the exercise does, which is to make the muscle uh, make more protein, which is basically uh, you make more and more of muscle protein. So the muscle cell increases in, 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 in its content and diameter and becomes a strong, uh, strengthens a little bit. The other way is to add more uh, muscle nuclei, myonuclei to the existing myofibers, and that is through the satellite cell. So both responses are triggered by exercise. But the fact that you cannot do weight uh, uh, training uh, suggests that uh, there is probably no uh, response from the satellite cells. This is what I kind of uh, uh, surmise from, from the reading of the literature. So we first have to check whether satellite cells are there and if they are there, are they functional? Yeah. That can be, that can be a good research should, project. Yeah, I yeah. think we'll, uh, we'll have, uh, uh, we'll have a muscle meeting and I call some of these people working on g &E so they can get together and form a larger groups and do a hardcore good science on muscles. I think from there only we'll, come out with the alternate therapy while we progress towards gene therapy and other things and drug screening. But we also need to do it. And both Dibbendu and uh, Gopal may benefit from some of the work that comes out. Sure. One thing about activating satellite cells, of course, is that even if you do activate the satellite cells, they're still going to be deficient in the g &E. They will be uh, deficient in yeah. the &E. so, so activating them is definitely secondary to fixing the primary problem, which is your GNE. And that's where gene therapy probably work out. Right. And whichever way you choose to fix it. No, I think we uh, go for both directions. Yeah. And she learned a little bit more uh, from muscle biology, whether what is the problem. I mean, if the some reason or other satellite cells are not being made or they are dying or they are not differentiating. So the problem could be because of it and gene therapy can correct till we find small molecules which may take a longer time. Anyway, I think Shilpi, you sort of more or less. Um, yeah, so I think that whatever, whether if there were any remaining questions, maybe they can be addressed in the chat itself. And now I will give the floor to my father uh, for his concluding remarks. So um, it's my pleasure and duty to uh, offer a vote of thanks. And um, Baba, a vote of thanks will be at the end. Right now, what I have to do? Concluding remarks. Okay. All right. So anyway, I want to thank all the speakers. They may not be there in the end. So... Um, and they really appreciate their taking time off uh, and all sorts of things that we went through for today's program, um, taking so much of time and, you know, coming and answering all the questions and giving a talk um, anywhere from California, all the way to Tirupati, Bangalore, all the hotspots of virus. So I'm, I'm really thankful to them. I, I really want to thank them before uh, goes away because some of them may not be present uh, in the next session that we have. Um, really, we appreciate that uh, uh, something that will uh, emerge out of it. As I said, that uh, there are tremendous potential that we can see uh, towards uh, therapy development, uh, gene therapy, both uh, you know viral based and 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 uh, non-viral based therapies can be taken forward. And those things can, um, can be done without knowing too much details about, uh, uh, about what is the problem, how the problem is, uh, why we are getting it, mechanism of pathogenesis, etc. So that's one thing that we have learned that uh, maybe we should go ahead to do that. 
And there are enough um, uh, instances to say that uh, if we plan to give direct uh, muscle-based uh, gene therapy system, then maybe we can circumvent a lot of other issues. And there are enough uh, published evidence to say that, uh, you know, AV vector can be taken up on this. Because as you know, the immunogenicity is a major issue with AV vector. But some of the uh, uh, some of the work that has been done shows that uh, you know direct diaphragm, for example, or eye or anywhere else, uh, doesn't cause this problem of uh, immunogenicity. And then other areas that is that uh, the clinical things uh, is very nice that uh, Delhi is uh, setting up. Uh, going to finally have a center for neuromuscular disorders. And we can see that um, uh, they, that center would come up, will help all the patients in the Northern Indian zone. And it can be developed into a center where some of the trials can be done. You know, if you have to do multicentric trials, we need centers other than NIMHANS. Of course, Nalini Center in NIMHANS is all suited to carry out. And that's something that will obviously make use of it to start any trial that is happening. Uh, also, then Delhi Center would be the other one uh, to do that. Uh, I haven't discussed with uh, Dr. Khadilkar, but uh, he says that he has a team. He may or may not be around for too many years, but his team is there. And they may also be interested for uh, developing a center in the in the Western India for for uh, developing and gene uh, for developing and this um, um, clinical trial sites for do that. That's very very important to do that. And then drug discovery is starting out. We haven't really gone far, but uh, we have submitted two projects on that, both structure based one and direct screening. And we are hoping that we'll get some funding from government to carry out these studies. We have support from the institutes to do that. Uh, and that's something that uh, will take its own course of time. There's certain advantage or disadvantage of drugs. And we'll see how that works out. Even if drug can reduce the progression of the disease and not cure it, I think that will be also welcome. Um, in terms of understanding muscles, generating IPS, whether the IPS cells eventually can be developed into a, a therapeutic, both autologous as well as uh, uh, allogenic IPS cells can work. I mean, that's something that um, many people, including Japan, is working on it. They are making a uh, library of uh, different uh, IPS cells from different haplotypes, or uh, HLA haplotypes for use of it. This is something It's not developing as fast as gene therapy is developing. So uh, some reason or other cell therapy is not uh, moving towards that. But cells can be tremendous use for as a model, as testing your therapy, as uh, understanding biology. So those kind of things that we will push with that. Having Cellular models will be a tremendous useful uh, in this. So what we heard from today is that there are a lot of good things that are happening. Work has started in India. Movement is there. A whole bunch of young scientists are involved in it. And I think the patient community and families should really think uh, that this is there is a momentum that has been created now. And this momentum has to be pushed further and and participation everybody is important and the patient groups together can do it and there's nothing that stops us from doing it and you can all see that so many people are putting a lot of their time into this and we have to all come together and support them so that they can reach their goal and this is a lesson that we must learn that we do it and if you really look at it all over the world you know, from Lale, we heard NDF, you know, the patient group supports NDF. And so is all the groups, the red group, the all sorts of uh, lysosomal storage disorder groups all over the world. There's the patient groups that drive it. 
the scientists do it but they need our support and we have to support them to do it. and with the uh, uh, this lesson i want to uh, with this uh, thing i want to um, conclude saying that there is a lot of positive energy and less less uh, all you know push those positive energies in a way that is like a rocket you know it just takes off then it has to be pushed beyond to go uh, beyond the earth's uh, atmosphere and we need that push and that push will come from friends uh, families and patients uh, do it and i would also thank the speakers because i don't think they'll be there at 7 o'clock that's what i'm thanking them i have already thanked them and i want to thank them again not only as a speakers in it and their their interest in working on gni myopathy which is something that i really appreciate we have fairly wide ranging of expertise and we'll definitely take it forward at some level or other i think dilip has a question dilip you have to unmute maybe not okay anybody else have any question okay again thank you all the speakers and uh, we'll uh, we'll get together and push it through and the agenda is more or less getting clear okay shall be thank you Thanks. thank you anuda thank you everyone thank you to all of you for thank also you. speaking in hindi and making it simple for us to understand we really appreciate that thanks so much and to everyone else